Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So in continuation of our summer farm tour series today, we are hanging out with a great Clara Coleman, host of the Winter Growers podcast, uh, who is going to show us around arguably one of the more famous farms in the country, her farm, Four Season Farm, founded by her father, farming legend, Elliot Coleman. Uh, this conversation tells a little bit of the story of that farm, but focuses a lot on their winter production and infrastructure there in Maine, which obviously comes with some challenges. Uh, she also discusses what Clara has learned doing the podcast from other winter growers. And she also talks about her work with Real Farmer Care, supporting the well-being of fellow growers. And of course, a whole lot of other interesting stuff. But Real quick, speaking of winter, uh, some places that you can find me and some of the team this winter of 2023 and 2024, I will be presenting at the Acres Eco Ag Conference just across the river from Cincinnati in early December 2023. I will also be presenting in Utah for the Utah Food and Farming Conference at the Red Acres Center about two hours from Vegas in January of 2024. Uh, the Organic Association of Kentucky has their annual conference in late January near our home farm here, and I will be presenting there as well, as always. Uh, love the Oak Conference. And I will be at the Organic Grower School. Don't hit it, kitty cat, it makes it shake. And I will be at the Organic Grower School in March presenting there in North Carolina near Asheville. Otherwise, enough for me. Let's get to it with my dear friend, farmer Clara Coleman of Four Season Farm. <music> Well, here we are at Four Season Farm. It is the summer solstice, longest day of the year. Um, this is Maine. There are black flies around, so you're gonna see them <laughs> buzzing around me. And this farm has been here over, gosh, 50, almost 55 years now, um, come October. Um, so my dad, Elliot Coleman, and my mom, uh, Sue, they moved here in 1968 and at that point it was just a spruce forest um, so they you know what you see now this is about 14 acres of cleared land um, but this was all forest when they arrived and they slowly sort of carved out the farm um, back in the 70s and uh, there was originally a farm stand here you know just summer people coming and getting their lettuce for like 10 cents a head um, and yeah, it, it had a little bit of a, a pause period in the 80s. Um, and then my dad moved back in 1990. And shortly thereafter met my stepmother, Barbara. And that's when it actually tr technically became Four Season Farm. Um, and that's when they really started experimenting with commercial production of year round greens and winter greens. and. Fast forward to 2016, I returned to the farm to help my dad um, run the farm and figure out the future of the farm. And um, yeah, it's just been growing and changing, evolving ever since. So Four Season Farm comprises about 40 acres total of land, uh, but we are only cultivating on intensively about an acre and a half, which also includes high tunnel space. Um, but there is this 14 acre footprint of sort of cleared acreage um, where the fields exist, uh, the homes exist, the other buildings exist. Let's see, we have nine, nine high tunnels total. Um, the largest is 36 by 96. That one we call Garfield because it doesn't move. Just like the cartoon cat, we always like to say that was large and doesn't move. So that's Garfield. Uh, but Garfield also serves as our sort of farm hub. We have a wash pack area. We have a walk-in cooler in about the first third of the footprint. Uh, and then the, the back two thirds is all in ground growing. And that's the one that we have the heater that we minimally heat in the winter to about, you know, 38 degrees, um, give or take. And then in the early spring, we will also heat to get our early tomatoes and cucumbers going uh, just for a short time period. So that's kind of, you know, our prime space. It's probably got some of the best soil. <laughs> um, and uh, all the other greenhouses are smaller. They range from 22 by 48 or 30 by 48 feet. Um, and they are also all movable, except for our you know, plant propagation house. And um, they are unheated 
because it's a lot easier to manage <laughs> um, not having that heater in there. And also we focus on the crops that are cold hardy and will survive the winter here. Um, so that includes spinach and uh, kale, leeks, or candy carrots. Yeah, because our lettuces, chard, those kind of things typically are in the heated, minimally heated greenhouse. So, so yeah, so that's the movability. It basically kind of expands our growing space for something like our candy carrots. You sort of have to have a movable tunnel because you need to sow those carrots, at least here at our latitude at the 44th parallel by mid-August in order to get enough time growing um, in the ground before we cover them with the greenhouse in late October, early November. Uh, but in early to mid-August, you have tomatoes growing in there or something else. So we can't rip that out. So having that movability allows us to sort of almost double our growing space or that footprint. The greenhouses or high tunnels are very instrumental and essential to this production model. Movable tunnels, movable greenhouses, whatever you want to call them, they definitely come with um, a higher learning curve uh, because First of all, you don't want them to blow away. <laughs> so you got to think about anchoring and making sure that they have some pretty solid anchoring um, while they're not moving. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most of that is solved by pretty decent ground anchors and chain binders, and that's what we've used. Also, the structure itself should be a certain size and have a certain structural integrity so that it can withstand winds and, you know, winter conditions. Um, so our, all of our movable tunnels are either a combination of uh, Rimmel greenhouse models or uh, tunnel vision hoops. Um, and they have moved various different ways. It's always changed over the years. Um, the, the sort of rolling thunder that maybe people are familiar with from Rimmel greenhouses was on a tr sort of a track system. Uh, it was the chain link fence uh, wheels that were rolling on a rail. Uh, then there's also the uh, V-Track system that had been an old four season tools model. Um, and then, then there was this uh, <laughs> uh, pneumatic tires that we would jack up the greenhouse with and insert them on just to move it. And essentially at the end of the day, we realized that just if you have a tractor, uh, just tow the thing on the ground with the tractor. <laughs> so sometimes we might put little like, you know, ski tips on the, the ends to keep it from diving into the ground when we're towing it with a tractor, but just using a basic sort of chain yoke and pull, you know, on the bucket and just pulling it backwards um, is pretty straightforward, you know, but the management of the crops, that part is got a higher learning curve because again, it's about the timing. You have to figure out when you plant stuff outside that you're gonna move that greenhouse over. Um, there's also a transitional period that always happens whenever crops go from being outdoors to indoors or vice versa in the spring. So, you know, understanding how they might become stressed by that transition. Uh, so that's the beauty of it is that things like spinach taste so much better. It's almost like a different vegetable in the winter. Everything becomes sweeter, more intensely colored. Um, yeah, just to me, it's like you have this whole other palette of, of vegetables in the winter that are different from the summer, even though they're the same crop. <laughs> in terms of the coverings of our high tunnels, we have gone through different versions of that. You know, uh, anything that was movable, unheated, was just a single layer of six mil poly, um, pretty standard. And the larger Garfield greenhouse, we had air inflated with two layers. Um, but then we eventually switched to solar wrap for most of them because solar wrap is just a single bubble layer, you know, uh, that has all these advantages compared to double layer air inflated. Um, it, it's like even a greater R value. If I remembering, it's like 1.87 R value, uh, has these light diffusive properties. Um, but the most important thing is it can last 25 plus years. So most farmers are familiar with having to reskin the greenhouse every four years, and that is expensive, time consuming, uh, labor intensive and 
you know, you have this plastic that you have to figure out how to reuse or recycle. Um, so the solar app, if you get 25 years out of it, obviously that's a lot easier on the farmer. It's, you know, typically more expensive, not as expensive as polycarbonate, but it seems worth it for that investment to have something that you won't have to my dad actually likes to joke, you know, because he's 84 now that he'll never have to reskin <laughs> greenhouse again in his lifetime, you know, unless, unless he lives to 120. <laughs> so the end walls of all of the movables have been sort of this eternal challenge. How do you design an end wall that accommodates moving over a crop, moving over the soil? Um, and so how you know we've dealt with that is doors typically now are on the sides as opposed to on the ends uh, so that deals with that and then usually we just have sort of like a hip wall that's up maybe at least three feet um, and then above that will be all of our venting or sort of passive venting we have these sort of butterfly windows that open and close from you know univent arm um, hinges and below that will usually be either a solar app or some sort of poly layer that we can just roll up. And then when we have to move it, it's just easy to roll it up, move it over and put it back down. So yeah, that, that still provides uh, room for improvement for sure. Yeah, I don't think there's necessarily a perfect setup for any of these tunnels. Um, probably the best one is the tunnel vision hoops because we have polycarbonate end walls for the upper portion with these butterfly windows. But even those are, have been challenging because the univents um, bust easily from the wind racking them in the winter. So anyway, there, there's still no perfect solution for these end walls, but um, always room for improvement. Um, well, the size has been important. The reason we typically, at one point, Elliot had um, larger tunnels that were movable that were about i think 96 feet long um, one of the challenges with that extra length uh, he has never been a believer of um, roll-up sides <laughs> so none of these greenhouses here have roll-up sides and the reason we can get away with that is because none of them are longer than 48 feet and so generally when you get into the middle of a 100 foot greenhouse, there's a dead airspace. So it's difficult for airflow to happen. Um, so we don't have any HAF fans in these movables um, because we don't need them and airflow can happen pretty passively. Um, so that's that's one consideration. You know, I know there are plenty of farmers that have movables that have roll up sides, so that's not a problem. It's just we chose not to do it. So the, the, they're more cumbersome if they're that much larger to move. You obviously would need a tractor to move them. We have, you know, one of our 48 foot models. We can push if it's on those rails. Um, even with the old pneumatic tire approach, we could actually use like um, a winch, a hand winch and pull them that way. So you can still make it very hand powered uh, with, with some of those other techniques for moving them. I think, Elliot's approach to four season farming, as well as my own, has always been the simplest methods possible. Obviously, less things to go wrong, less things to break. Um, and, you know, you, sort of minimizing the complexity of it means more people can access it. Um, at least they can learn how to do it. Uh, it's really quite simple if all you're doing is just providing this structure that is protecting a crop and allowing you to continuously harvest it. Um, so there's, there's a beauty in the simplicity of that. And I think that's always been a driver for my dad. Um, it, it, you know, it does, it also, I think it resonates with the energy of winter too, right? Like as farmers, we need time to rest, even if we are growing year round. So there is this sort of like, okay, it's eight o'clock in the morning. It is cloudy and below zero out. I guess we can't harvest anything right now. We're gonna have to wait until, you know, 11 a.m. when the sun comes out and things thaw enough to go out and harvest. Uh, so it, it almost imposes this rest period, uh, which I think is important and helpful. 
and it minimizes the use of um, you know fossil fuels you know of course we all want to do that and find more sustainable ways to be able to grow food year-round um, but on the flip side of that it, it's going to reduce the quantities that are available and um, you know with the size of production we have here we really can expand more beyond the footprint of these tunnels right so if we lived in a larger area it would be very difficult for us to serve more people um, so because we're in a remote area we can kind of use what we have and the techniques we have to mostly satisfy our local customers um, but that's also why we combine the fresh pro produce in the winter with the storage crops so we can have a combination of uh, potential sales and food available so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I think there's, again, so many different ways to do this and there's no one right, perfect way to do it. Um, a lot of it has to do with lifestyle choice, business choice, um, you know, yeah, time management choices. So having a more passive, uh, simpler system, I think just resonates with kind of the ethos of this farm too. And even, you know, some of the past guests that I've interviewed, you know, like Danya at Queens Greens Farm, how she's just harvesting winter greens in the, during the winter. And then the summer season, it's more about the farm itself and not about sales. So trying to find these um, niches of where you can focus your sales and your energy and your time. Um, or farmers in the South that do it in the, the, you know, they do all their production more in the summer, but don't do any sales as well, and then only sell in the winter. So a lot of different ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the Winter Growers podcast uh, began sort of as a, an idea um, or a proposal, we'll say. Uh, Jesse Frost had reached out to me saying that he really wanted to expand content on the No Tilted Growers channel and wanted to sort of have um, either farmers or producers sort of specialize in certain topics. And since he knew um, of my connection to Four Season Farm and winter growing, he asked if I would be the host of the show and really just kind of gave me creative liberty to figure out who I wanted to interview, design the um, interview hours and the um, content and the, the overarching themes. So I, you know, this was kind of at the beginning of the pandemic. So I really just had fun figuring out, you know, what topics I wanted to cover, who I wanted to interview. Um, I came up with that lightning round question is a great way to uh, get to know people a little bit more because it's always like you can only talk about so many techniques and, you know, you don't really get to know someone that way. Um, and yeah, and you know, I didn't have any background in doing podcasting before. It was really just sort of something I did off the cuff. But the thing about it that I loved is how I could take an hour or an hour and a half and connect with people on a whole different level. Um, you know, they could be on the other side of the world and I could learn about them and their lives and their passion for farming in a whole different way and it really was just this conversation um, so i have always looked at what i've done as more as conversations than interviews um, really just want to understand why people do this what the challenges are you know what the joys are um, why they do it and um, how we can all learn how to do this better um, the one big lesson I've learned is there's no one right way to do winter growing or year round growing for that matter. It is incredibly difficult to grow year round, um, just because of time management, because of burnout, uh, all these reasons that make it exceedingly difficult. Um, the learning curve of it is hard infrastructure, uh, but the demand and need for local you know, produce means we have to grow it in the winter, um, whether you're in Maine or you're in Florida, right? So, uh, so it's been great to, to expand the scope of what winter growing actually is and look at it less from being in a northern climate to just anywhere that you're growing in the winter months um, of, of that part of the country. Uh, so I really enjoyed listening to like farmers from Texas, for instance, talk about their challenges with winter growing 
and um, or ones from, you know, up in Canada where they get, you know, barely six hours of sunlight during the winter um, and how they can do it. Uh, so there's been a lot of learning that I've been able, you know, to to find from these conversations and really great connections that I've made with these farmers. There's one thing when you talk about the technique, right? There's another thing about how you manage your business um, and that all of these things are interconnected. You can't sort of isolate one without the other. So, you know, just because you might have these incredible techniques and figured out, you know, how to, you know, how to, how to the timing of things or, you know, how to sell them or whatever, it doesn't mean that your work life balance is great. So, how do we figure out all of these combined things together and create a farming life that allows you to grow year round? So it's, it's been interesting to hear that there's so much more of that um, to sort of winter growing as, as a career choice as opposed to just the actual technique of how to do it. You know, when I first started it, um, I had also recently started Real Farmer Care, which has been a, originally it was just a crowdfunding project to support farmers' well-being and self-care. And uh, right now there are 238 recipients. It was started in January of 2020. And um, those recipients essentially received around $100 to put towards some sort of self-care activity. Uh, and they would also provide a photo and a few sentences about what self-care meant to them on the farm or in context of farming. Um, and then they would also recommend the next recipient. So it's grown, you know, in these incredible ways. And it also allowed me to um, be introduced to new farmers, farmers that I had never heard of before. So I, I selected a lot of the, um, the first 10 uh, farmers who were also real farmer care recipients that I hadn't heard of before. Um, so Alex of um, Old City Acres in Michigan, and he was a new farmer starting out. And um, so that, you know, just bringing in sort of new voices, new, uh, new approaches, uh, new backgrounds, I think was really important to me. And, um, and then combining sort of the work with real farmer care with these interviews was great too. You know, my vision for Real Farmer Care is to grow it beyond just the $100 self-care um, sort of donation to programming, to developing programming that can help sustain farmers in this work, um, not just on a, you know, a quick little treat themselves to a massage or whatever, but actually like, let's look at some of the real issues that are happening or the real barriers um, to why it's so difficult to maintain your mental health when you're farming, um, how to avoid burnout. Uh, so how do we give farmers permission to take the time that they need to care for themselves and care for their community uh, so that we can keep farming? Um, so programming could look like um, therapy stipends if they wanted to seek you know, therapy support, um, whether mental health support or body care support. Um, it could look like, you know, partnering with um, industry leaders in the food and farming world who could provide in-kind donations for these farmers to sort of help them um, have the tools and supplies that they need to do, do the work that they're doing. Um, or, you know, access micro loans for their business. I mean, just other ways to sort of really shine a light on, like, how can we care for our farmers? Um, and um, assist them in this incredible work that they're doing when we know it's very hard on their hearts, minds, and bodies. I just really want to help sort of elevate the farmer as, you know, their stories about how, you know, it's both incredible what they're doing, but also challenging and not, um, not ignore the challenges basically. And, and how can we um, share our stories so we can connect more about probably many very common uh, issues <laughs> that, you know, because we're sort of isolated out on our farms, we don't actually know that other people are experiencing very similar things. Um, so this is really important to me to, to use as a way to connect farmers as well. If, if anyone wants to support ind individually, um, you can go to realfarmercare.com 
and there is a donation link. You can also go to fourseasonfarm.com and there's a donation link. Um, you can also find all of the farmer's stories on realfarmercare.com as well as Instagram. So um, those are the avenues of where you can support it. Huge thank you to Clara and to Jackson who filmed and edited this video. Uh, make sure to check out the Winter Growers podcast hosted by Clara. Don't forget, if you appreciate this work, you can always support it by just buying an awesome and nerdy farm book that I wrote called the Living Soil Handbook. But do that at notollgrowers.com. The proceeds go to making you more videos like this, or you can buy a hat or other merch, or just go to patreon.com slash notollgrowers and sign up, or you can hit that super thanks button. That works too. It is because people do those things that we can make all of the content we make. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. And what I found when I moved back in 2016 is that if I could isolate and concentrate the farm stand to one day for a short time period, then it would create this sort of event mentality, but also it's just a lot of less time and effort on the farmer and the farm workers.